It's been quite a week for the city of Toronto. <laughs> and emotions are running high. Some feel sorry for the mayor, watching him unravel right before our very eyes. He seems a victim of his addictions. We see that he is a man at risk, and we simply want him to get the help that he needs. Watching some of those videos, we can feel only pity for him. There are other emotions too, of course. Reading the international news or watching how Rob Ford is the butt of every late night comedian's jokes, we citizens of Toronto are downright embarrassed. How is it that this man became the representative of our city, the fourth largest city in North America? How is that possible? The embarrassment comes because in a democracy we get to we get the leaders we choose. The citizens of Toronto elected this mayor, and so his failure is to some degree our failure. And others have expressed not sad sadness and not embarrassment, but anger. The mayor has been entrusted with a high position of public service, and he has made a mockery of this trust and he has brought shame to the office. It seems a leader's lack of humility has led to his own humiliation. At last week's Shabbat dinner table, the topic of our conversation turned to the question, should leaders be held to a higher standard? Some at our Shabbat dinner table said yes, and some said no. Our 12-year-old, a bar mitzvah in the making, commented that since a leader is put at a high station, he has farther to fall than an ordinary person, and that the longer, harder fall from a high station is actually part of the punishment. I would agree with that. And I would say that the opposite is also true. Climbing up to a high station through dedicated service and devotion is part of the reward of holding a high office. The climb, the ascent itself, is part of the reward. We learn this first, or third, we learn this early from Jacob. And we learn this too from our veterans. And we learn this too from our bar mitzvah, Liam, as well. First, Jacob. In this week's parasha, Jacob learns, for the first time, he learns the dignity of work. Seven years he labors, and then another seven more, and six after that. He is not working for his father-in-law. He does not admire Lavan. He does not even like him. He is simply keeping his promise and earning his pay. And Jacob learns that there is dignity in working hard for what you want. As a teenager and a young man, he got what he wanted by taking it through manipulation and trickery. But now, as a mature person, Jacob leaves Haran with his head held high. He has earned this large flock through years of physical labor. He has earned this large family through years of devotion. And for the first time, he feels he is a real man. For the first time, he is not running away from anything. He's not running away in fear or in shame, as he once ran away from his father's house, from his brother's anger. Now Jacob stands tall before Lavan and walks away like a prince, wearing the crown that comes from the dignity of work, a particular kind of service. Even Lavan can see it. Even Lavan respects Jacob now. The end of our parsha tells of a glorious scene. Vayashkem Lavan Baboker. Lavan got up early in the morning. I don't picture him to be a man who gets up early in the morning to work. But on this day, to say farewell to Jacob and his daughters, Lavan gets up early in the morning 
and he kisses his sons and his daughters, and he blesses them. Then Lavan goes his way, and Jacob goes his way. And when Jacob set out on his journey with his many wives and his many children and a massive flock streaming behind him, our text says, Vayifge'u vo malachei Elohim. The angels of God accompanied him along the way. This was the blessing that came to him through service. The mayor says he is working for the taxpayers of Toronto. I'm sure he believes he is working hard for the people of this fine city. But saying it and believing it does not make it so. Hard work is usually marked with the crown of dignity. Those angels which accompanied Jacob as he made his way after years of service, those angels are usually easy to spot. They hover just above the worker. No matter how high or how low his position, no matter the status that comes with his profession, if he works hard and knows the dignity of service, those angels lift his weary bones and present him or her with the rewards of self-esteem and pride and a high place in the life of the family for whom she or he provides. There is another kind of service that comes with its own blessings. Our Torah portion speaks of the dignity of work. This Shabbat, we call attention to another kind of service, which comes with a unique kind of nobility. It is our custom at Holy Blossom Temple to mark this Shabbat before Remembrance Day by honoring our veterans and praying for the protection of those who currently serve in the Canadian Armed Forces and remembering the soldiers who fell in service to this good country. In addition to the dignity of work, there is, for some, another kind of nobility of service. Some choose it, and some are called to it. Just a few weeks ago, a, moment, a monument was erected to call attention to the 202 Jewish Canadians who served during the First World War. In anticipation of the coming 100th anniversary of that First World War, the monument now stands tall in Mount Sinai Memorial Cemetery. It is the only monument in this country which lists the names of the 201 Jewish servicemen and the one Jewish servicewoman of World War I. We know that they came from small towns across Canada and that some were only 15 or 16 years old when they began their term of service. They represented then no less than 38% of Canada's Jewish male population at the time. I read that our mayor could not attend the dedication of this World War I monument four weeks ago. The newspaper ex explained that he was away on city business. Deputy Mayor Norm Kelly represented him and gave to the Jewish Brigade known as the General Wingate Branch Number 256 a letter from Mayor Ford. In it, he writes, the, these are our heroes and we thank them and their families for their selfless and unwavering support to defending freedom's frontier, selfless and unwavering, indeed. The nobility of service to country is unique, and the men who stood here just moments ago know it in a way that few today do. Our beloved congregant Leonard Levy once told me that when the local military offices in Toronto had filled their quotas, young Jewish men like him drove to far-off towns throughout Ontario in order to enlist 
So eager were they to join in the fight against Hitler, Leonard said. There was in Canada then, as Rabbi Appleby mentioned, a very high proportion of Jews in the military of World War II. In fact, out of every nine Jewish souls, one out of every nine men Jewish, uh, men, women, and children, wore the Canadian uniform then. Today we honor them. The men who came before us for that special aliyah, you are still an inspiration. You stand for a kind of courage that is virtually unseen today. You stand for a kind of wholehearted service that is virtually unknown in our country today. We do not wish to go back to the dire circumstance of that time, God forbid, when such courage was called for. But we do long for some measure of that kind of devotion and service to God and country. We do long for a time when purpose is clear and certain. As our vet veterans stand shoulder to shoulder today, we see them once again as young men, and those angels who watched over them and protect them then, those angels who accompanied you over sea and land and sky, they accompany you still this day. And you wear the crown of their glory. The nobility of service will always be yours. Three kinds of service. Jacob exemplifies the dignity of hard work. Our veterans exemplify service to country. And our bar mitzvah today exemplifies service to God and humanity through the taking on of mitzvot. And that is also an inspiration to us. This day as it is every Shabbat, every day when we call one of our young people to the Torah for the first time, when he or she makes public his or her commitment to Torah and mitzvot. Human beings of flesh and blood are not perfect. To quote the mayor, we make mistakes. And in Jewish life, we believe there is power in teshuva. We believe there is a disciplined way back from transgression, back from a breach of trust, back from even a crime. And it's not only on Yom Kippur that we reflect on these themes, but every day. Our morning and evening Amidah during the week, we talk about teshuva. We pray that we will come to know a way back, a way back to God and service. We believe there is some kind of protective nature in a life of mitzvot. That moment that Rabbi Appleby spoke of when someone is transformed, when someone crosses over the threshold from childhood to adulthood, it could be that that's also what came at the beginning of this week's Torah portion for Jacob. It starts off where he is young and he is afraid and he is all alone in the dark. He puts his head down on a low ground He's in a lowly way. He has done wrong. And so he puts his head down on that rock pillow and he has that miraculous dream, that marvelous dream of a ladder with its feet on the ground and its top in the heavens. The only way to get from here to there, he learns, is by slow and steady steps of mitzvot. He sees at once his great potential to ascend in service to something noble, to something admirable. And at the very same time, he sees how he can trip and fall, only to rise again if he musters his courage. And so we see ourselves in Jacob of that dream. We know that even in our dreams, there are no leaps. 
Only slow and steady steps, rung by rung, mitzvah by mitzvah, we ascend step by step. When Jacob awoke, he said those famous words, Mano Raha Makom Hazeh, how awesome is this place. Ein ki im Beit Elohim, this is none other than the house of God. Jacob's eyes were open, and he was ready to commit himself to a life of service. It wasn't a straight path. It wasn't a straight ascent. He still would slip and fall, but he would recover because he came to understand his place in God's world. Words must be met with action. We learn this from Jacob. We learn this from our veterans. We learn this from our bar mitzvah. After Jacob's words, Mano Rahma Kom Hazeh, how awesome is this place, how full of God's presence, he brushes himself off and he sets to work. And he takes that heavy stone from under his head and he uses all of his strength to turn it upright, to turn it over on its side so that it stands tall as a pillar. Jacob takes that dream and he makes it a reality. He makes it concrete. And he also makes it beautiful by dedicating it to something greater than himself. And he pours precious oil over it to give it luster. I'll conclude with one of the prayers that we spoke this morning about how a life of mitzvot can elevate us in nobility how a life of service to God can bring us joy and protection that might otherwise be unknown. V'ha'er e'neinu b'toratecha, v'dabek libeinu b'mitzvotecha. Enlighten our eyes with your Torah that we may cling to your mitzvot, O God. V'lo nevosh le'olam va'ed, and then we will know no shame. For we will put our trust in you, in your great and holy name, Nagila Venismecha Bishuatecha, and then we will come to know joy and gladness as we come to behold your saving power. Amen.